Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the first of our How to Negotiate with Impact series. My name is Lindsay Cresswell, and I work at Side Business School in our executive education programmes. I work on the Strategy, Risk and Reputation team, and our programmes include the Oxford Strategic Marketing Programme, the Oxford Scenarios Programme, the Corporate Affairs Academy, and the Oxford Programme on Negotiation. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Tim Cullen, who is the Programme Director of the Oxford Programme on Negotiation, and he will be leading today's webinar. So without further ado, Tim, it would be wonderful to hear from you about how to negotiate with impact and today's um, focus of influence and the influence of trust and reciprocity. Thanks very much, Cindy. Um... Very nice to be with you all this afternoon. It seems as if a lot of people have signed up, uh, which is great, and I look forward to your questions. Um, I'm going to go pretty much straight into um, the uh, into my slide deck. Um, uh, we started this program about 15 years ago, and uh, and I uh, basically was the founder of it, and we built it up over the years um, to be, I think, a very interesting program. So what I'm hoping I can do today is give you some useful takeaways, um, the sort of things uh, we cover in the program. Um, and um, so I hope I hope it'll be informative and I hope uh, you'll, you'll have some good questions. So let me start off by, um, now there's, I've got a technical problem. I don't seem to be able to advance the slide. <laughs> Sorry, um, I don't know why that is. That was working perfectly well minutes ago. Okay, so how am I going to advance it now? Okay, it is it is working now. Obviously, there was a problem. I'm sorry about that. Um, so my, my my first slide you can see is uh, what sort of negotiation, and I think people sometimes ask me. Um, with the program you're teaching at the side business school, um, is it is it for diplomats? Is it for lawyers? Is it for CFOs? Is it to help people with mergers and acquisitions, etc.? And and my answer is always well, it's really all of the above. So I've, I've just laid out there a few bullets, of the sort of things that today's audience one of one or more of those will should resonate with you. And so obviously. Um, major negotiations between companies, but also just business to business activities more broadly. And then within companies, um, there are negotiations go on all the time between employers and employees. Uh, sometimes the annual performance review uh, turns into a big negotiation because the person being reviewed doesn't want any of the negative remarks to be in the permanent record. And so they will try to negotiate those out. Um, and then uh, in our lives generally, uh, when you buy or sell a house, that may involve a degree of negotiation, or will, will to some extent, cars, boats, other things you're, 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 you're buying and selling. Um, family and friends um, in our daily lives. Um, I uh, sometimes regret that um, at the early stages of the Oxford program on negotiation, both my son and my daughter, when they were university students, um, interned on the program, and, um, and I think they're rather better negotiators than my wife and I are now, so um, uh, we're, we're conscious of that. Um, and then there are the very big ones, governments, um, United Nations, World Trade Organization, and so on. So all of these involve negotiations, and, they, uh, they're, they're, and I assume that they're the sort of things that you get involved in. So. Uh, let's look at today's subject, which is specifically reciprocity and trust. Um, and uh, so the first thing for we're getting into that is just to flag to you some fundamental rules that we teach in the Oxford Programme and Negotiation, and which um, you, you just have to remember. There are lots more than these, but these are just some sort of, you know, particular flagship things you need to remember. The first is do your homework. It is amazing how many people go into a negotiation without knowing enough about everything that they need and without having done any homework at all often on what the other side needs. And so I have a bullet there that says know all your interests and those of your counterpart. 
So I refer to the person across the table or the group of people across the table from you as your counterparts. Tim, we've got an issue with the audio. We need to just restart. We're really sorry, but is, is it, are we okay just to rerun back from Tinsy quickly? In, in, um, I'm right. saying this down again. I'm very sorry, but is that okay? Can they hear me now or not? The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Sorry. Do you want to start from the beginning? Uh, yeah, from back to the first slide. Please. Okay. Sorry, everybody out there. There is evidently <laughs> a problem with the audio. Um, uh, can you hear me okay now? Or is my voice coming across correctly? It should be fine there. Excellent. Yeah, apologies for, for this. Well, um, I will quickly run over what I covered before, um, which was just that first slide you have in front of you at the moment is, and maybe you did hear it, but didn't hear it clearly enough, just it's the range of types of negotiation that typically business people or people in the public sector typically end up doing. And I mentioned that in addition to the first few bullets, which are our work negotiations, the last four are the things we do in our private lives, uh, or the last the next two, and then the very big negotiations, the one we, ones we read about in the newspapers, peace treaties, trade agreements, uh, Brexit, for example. Um, so this is the sort of range of things. What I'm trying to say is that um, we negotiate constantly, all the time. It may be a negotiation between two seven-year-olds, as to who gets the front seat in the car, um, or it, 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 it may be just uh, negotiating over something they're buying, and so on. So it's just a, a big range of things, and the, 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 the rules are pretty much the same, irrespective of the type of negotiation. So let's get to some of these fundamental rules, and these are things just to sort of remember. Do your homework, and as I said, anybody who caught what I said first time round, um, people often don't. Uh, it's amazing how many people go into negotiations without really fully understanding what they want to get out of it, but actually in some ways even more important, uh, knowing what the other side wants to get out of it. Now, you'll see that I say that you should know all of your interests, all of the things that are important to you that could be issues on which the, you could reach agreement with the person across the table or the team across the table. You see I use the word counterpart. And very often you'll hear people talking about their opponent in a negotiation. And that's one thing that we try to banish from our lexicon is the idea that negotiation is, is a competitive sport or that it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a battle to be fought. It's uh, the best negotiations are the ones where you have put yourself in the shoes of the other people, you put yourself in the counterpart's shoes, really look at it from their point of view and understand all the pressures they may be under and all the, the importance of all the issues to them. And then, and this is where we get to reciprocity, to look at all the issues in play and know the relative value to each side, both yourselves and your counterpart, of every issue because they will often be different. And let's just look at how that works out. So what is reciprocity? Well, for the engineers and physicists out there, there's a, there are definitions uh, that relate uh, to, to engineering, but I, I won't do it quite simply uh, on this. And that is the idea that if I give you something, I expect something in return and vice versa. Very simple. Now, Economists out there will be familiar with how international trade works, comparative advantage. So if country A can produce a product uh, inexpensively and export it to country B, where it would be expensive for them to produce it, uh, and vice versa with other products, you then have trade. And actually, negotiation is exactly the same idea. When you have uh, an issue which may be of different value to each side, that gives you the opportunity to make trades. Mm -hmm. So let me just give you an example of this. Um, a few years ago, um, I had a call from the cabinet secretary of a small country, a small prosperous country with beautiful weather. Uh, the call came in, uh, in I think it was December, it was about this time of the year, the weather in the UK was not very nice. And they said, we were wondering whether you guys can come and deliver a negotiation program for us. 
and we're thinking of doing it uh, about a year from now. So it was going to be bad weather in England and beautiful weather in this place. So I really wanted to do it. I was really up for this. Um, now, as the discussion progressed, um, I wanted to convince him that our program was the sort of program he wanted. And so I proposed to him, I said, look, why don't you, um, if you're going to be in the UK at all, why don't you uh, time it for when we run the Oxford program on negotiation? Because we always run one in, in June and another in September. And if you can be there at the same time, you can come on the program completely free of charge. Now, just think about it. What I was offering him. I was offering him £7,800 worth of executive education for nothing. Help him make his decision about whether to have the program, but he was also getting a lot for that. What was I giving away? I was giving away nothing because if there are 35 people in the class or 36 people in the class, actually to us teaching it doesn't really make any difference. That's not to belittle everybody in the class, but it doesn't really make a difference how many people you actually have in the room. So it was absolutely nothing for me to give away. The cost to me was zero. The value to him was £7,800. It's just an illustration of how this works. And you're always looking, when you're looking at all your list of items to negotiate, you're looking for where the value and cost to each side is different. There will always be minor differences, but when you get big differences, then you can really make trades effectively. And the other part of the title of this webinar is, is trust. Um, and so why, why is trust important? Well, the way we approach negotiation is that we want both sides to end up being happy. Now, that's not just a nice sort of pleasant thought, uh, but if both sides get a satisfactory outcome, um, you're likely to be able to negotiate with the people again, and uh, actually you will almost certainly have created value because you would have been able to do these trades that I referred to. So uh, a mutually satisfactory outcome, obviously you want your side to meet as many of your objectives as possible and it to be a particularly good outcome for you, but having the other side have a good outcome is also very desirable. So you can actually, you may be negotiating with the same people again, and that's, uh, that's, that's something that you want to, to build up. And sometimes you may decide that you're going to perhaps give a little bit more away, concede a little bit more, because you know this is the first of several negotiations. Now, there are some rules that people often don't um, obey, um, and, uh, and, and that does relate to trust. And so, if you promise things that you cannot deliver, that's really self-defeating. So you don't want to go in negotiation and promise, promise the earth to the other side or to tell the people on your own side who are watching these negotiations about all these wonderful, wonderful things that are going to be achieved. So I think it's important to, to, to manage expectations and don't uh, try to sort of position yourself better in negotiation by promising a lot of things which, which you really can't deliver. And as I point out, it raises false expectations on your own side, and it does mean the other side may be less willing to do deals with you. Now, just in the papers recently, we've uh, been hearing, uh, in the context of the Brexit negotiations, we've been hearing a lot of talk about red lines. Now, red lines are threats. Now, if you quite are 100% convinced that if a red line is crossed, that there will be a, a, a very definite penalty, then by all means use that. But do be careful that whenever you lay out uh, red lines or ultimatums or anything like that, you're making yourself a hostage to fortune. And if you don't then follow through on a threat, uh, you lose credibility and you therefore lose a lot of strength in the negotiation. So uh, we always teach people in our program, don't make threats and only make threats if you're 100% certain that you're willing to follow through on them because people often make threats simply to reinforce the line they're taking. But you need to find other ways of reinforcing that line without making threats, without saying this is a red line, 
that cannot be crossed. Because if it is crossed and you don't do anything about it, you lose credibility. So it's quite important. And then, I mean, the other part of trust, obviously, is very clearly um, not to lie. Um, a lot of people think that lying is okay in negotiations. Um, in fact, in the American Bar Association um, uh, model rules for professional conduct, they actually say um, attorneys should not lie. Attorneys, an advocate should not say anything that is not true. But then they have a footnote to that that says, ah, but if it's in a negotiation, some sort of inexactitude or whatever euphemism they use for lying uh, is kind of okay. It's kind of generally accepted. And we feel, and the way we teach our program, that lying is a very bad thing. It undermines the whole concept of reciprocity because if you don't know what the actual correct information is about what the other side is offering or what you're offering uh, because it isn't really a genuine offer, uh, that doesn't help. Um, lying inevitably creates tension with your counterpart. Um, if you're caught in a lie, the trust level drops and uh, it becomes a, a vicious negative cycle. And the other thing is that if you lie, it damages your reputation. So uh, the answer is simply don't lie. A lot of people think it's okay, that bluffing is, is okay in negotiation. And I think part of the problem is that a lot of people um, think about the first negotiation they can remember, which was maybe when they were traveling abroad, they were trying to buy something in a bazaar, they knew they'd never see the person again, and both sides almost by definition are going to lie to each other. But we basically say don't lie. And also don't justify your white lies by saying they're exaggeration or bluffing. Um, a lie is a lie is a lie, and you know if you're telling a lie, and it doesn't really help you in a negotiation. So um, let me just uh, say a word or two about um, the, the I'm, I'm deliberately not telling you everything we teach in the program because actually to squeeze a four and a half day program into 25 minutes uh, would be a little bit difficult anyway. Um, but um, we will be having, uh, as Zinzi mentioned, we're going to be having a couple more of these webinars and we can touch on other areas. Today it was really primarily about reciprocity, which is absolutely the heart of all negotiations and the importance of trust. And these are things we do emphasize in this program. Um, I think that our program, uh, we love teaching it. Uh, we've got, I think, a good faculty. We have uh, five different teachers uh, spread over the week. I teach probably about almost a third of it myself. Um, we also introduced something uh, fairly in the last couple of years, and that is that we have tutors. Uh, this is with part of the tradition of Oxford is to actually have tutors, so there's a lot of personal attention. So people who come on the program have a chance to get feedback on the way they're coming across in negotiations, and they have a chance to, to ask our tutors how they should address a particular um, issue that they're facing in their work and so on. So we think that's that's quite good. Um, we, we, we have interesting speakers, um, certainly uh, two evenings during the week, um, we have on the Thursday evening of this coming set of programs, we have a wonderful speaker who's uh, done it several times for us, that's Sue Williams, who is the world's leading hostage negotiator, former very, very senior officer at Scotland Yard, um, head of the hostage unit there, and she is somebody who's uh, been very, very successful in, uh, in, in having hostages released. And so uh, we have people like that. Being in Oxford, uh, well, we're biased, but we think it's a pretty nice place to be. And the university is, the broader university is, 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 is very interesting. Um, uh, something we have, um, it's not really up to us, it's the people who apply, but we, we have very diverse participants. Usually we have people from 20 or more countries um, very, very different backgrounds, very different cultures. Um, and we do actually devote half a day to cross-cultural negotiation because it's important to be tolerant of people from different cultures and not be thrown by behavior which seems different to our own. Um, and then um, at the heart of what we do, we have a lot of um, case studies and simulations. And uh, quite a few of the ones that we teach are ones that, um, that we have written ourselves. 
Um, and so they're, they're original and, and we hope interesting for you. So and then finally, I'd just say that um, we always feel pretty pleased that when everybody assembles on the first night and they sort of awkwardly talking to each other and so on, and by the end of the week, they're very good friends and the whole learning experience I think people generally find it quite a lot of fun. And um, so, uh, and, and, and finally, I would just say that the feedback we get is that the things that we're teaching on the program do seem to work. So um, uh, it, it, it's uh, certainly, we, we, love, we love teaching it. And I think most of our participants enjoy learning from it. So I think that uh, what we're gonna do now is to, um, uh, look at some of the questions you've been um, you've been filing because because I was afraid it was going to put me off what I was talking about. I've not actually been seeing them as they're coming in, but my colleagues have been assembling them. And um, so, the, one first question is is uh, to the question is whether uh, uh, you know how to address trust issues in complex negotiations uh, and what is important to consider. And, and I think that. I think in any negotiation, the trust issue is very, very important. Um, I think one of the difficult things in, in, in very complex negotiations, um, information gathering is very, very important. And I think there's a fine line between being open and, uh, and uh, generating trust and goodwill and giving things away um, and there's nothing wrong with keeping your cards fairly close to your chest, so long as you don't lie. And if people ask you a question, try to answer it honestly. And one of the questions that you can answer in a complex negotiation is simply, you know, either I can't tell you that, or I'm not ready to tell you that, or that's something we may be able to talk about later. I think that the key thing in a complex negotiation is just be straightforward, and, and open. And if you are not willing to say things, come right out and say, I can't tell you that at the moment, or I've, for a variety of reasons, it's not something I can, uh, I can talk about at this stage. Well, the next question I've been asked is, um, what are the real life experiences of core faculty teaching the course? Um, or maybe I should start myself. Um, I uh, worked for many years for the World Bank in Washington, which is not a bank in the normal sense of the word, but it's a, in fact a specialized agency of the UN. Um, and, um, and before that, I worked for a big commercial bank, and before that, for a uh, for Ford Motor Company, a big car company. Um, and then in the 18 years since I left the World Bank, I've been involved in a lot of negotiations all over the world. Um, so, for example, I uh, worked with the Commission on Growth and Development with the Nobel Prize winner Mike Spence, and there were 21 very, very smart people who brought all their experiences together as that commission, along with the uh, research of a lot of tremendous economists. And so you can imagine that by the end of a two-year experience, all these economists were finding it even more difficult to agree than at the beginning. And so we negotiated, we helped them negotiate agreements that they could all sign up to is one example. Uh, I also negotiated uh, on behalf of the World Bank uh, to help create uh, a little bit more harmony on the question of whether to build hydropower projects. I also uh, was very much involved in the re reconstruction of Bosnia and negotiations to raise money for the reconstruction, but also to uh, try to iron out disagreements between the various different parties, not only the people on the ground uh, in the different entities in Bosnia, but also between um, the, uh, the UN High Representative, the European Union, the World Bank, and so on. So I don't want to, I've, I've had quite a lot of other experiences. Um, the real life experience of uh, Michael Gates, for example, who teaches our cross cultural bit, uh, Michael is. Um, he actually is, is a, a, a language scholar from Oxford, um, but he um, went out as a fairly young man uh, to work in Finland, and he stayed there. Um, now, for teaching cross-culture, Michael has a, 
uh, a, a very uh, varied uh, ancestry. So his his own he's a sort of cross cultural example in himself. But Finland is a country where they have uh, two official languages. Um, they're tucked away in the northeast corner of Europe. Uh, so they uh, the way they do things is a lot differently from others. But Michael is very very experienced and, uh, and, a, and a real scholar on all aspects of cross culture. Um, we have uh, the, amongst the others. We, we, well, Michelle Pecker has been involved uh, in, she's actually written a book on negotiation. Um, and again, she's worked in a political environment in the United States. Uh, she's also lived in France for a long time. So again, she's got had a lot of experience um, in, um, uh, in, in negotiating again from different cultures. Um, so, um, I mean, that gives you a bit of a flavor. Um, uh, and um, uh, Owen Derbyshire has, uh, is our very, very, uh, he's our academic director. He's a full time faculty member of the Side Business School uh, and of the University of Oxford. Um, he, he has direct experience in collective bargaining um, and negotiating between uh, trade unions and management and so on. So it's, it's, it's a real mixture. Um, let's see, what else have we got? <laughs> in your experience, what tends to be the things that go wrong in a negotiation and how can these be addressed? Well, I think the starting point for things going wrong is when you have not done your homework. I think that's the most significant thing is um, that you're ill prepared. Now, you're never going to be prepared for everything, um, but um, uh, that's that's the that's what tends to make things go wrong. Now, obviously you can be thrown out by not understanding the other side sufficiently. And I think that also not knowing, uh, you know, maybe perhaps giving too much away. Now we're talking today about reciprocity. Um, and sometimes one of the things that goes wrong is that people will give something away and sit and wait and expect that something's going to be given back to them and it isn't. So we do encourage negotiators to uh, label their, um, their, their concessions. If you're giving something away, let the other side know you're giving away um, and, and don't just give things away and hope that something's going to come to you in return because life is not really like that. Um, I mean, the other things that can go wrong, uh, obviously sometimes there'll be external shocks uh, that can, um, uh, put a, a, a negotiation off. Um, so th th one of the things that can help you there is when you're actually drafting your ultimate agreement um, to actually build in um, uh, build in some conditions um, and, and say that uh, a contingency clauses is what I should really say, that if X happens, uh, we will, we will uh, we would agree to a slightly different approach. So I think that where you can protect yourself against uncertainty and negotiation is generally about something that's going to happen in the future. So it, it, it's anticipating problems before they occur, really. And I have another question. What if you're working in an environment uh, where people don't trust each other? Yeah, well, I suppose um, we have to say that's perhaps what is happening with Brexit um, in that one gets the impression that um, nobody seems to trust each other very much um, uh, on either side, really, and they don't trust the other side very much. So I think the, the answer to that is is actually be careful with your rhetoric, um, you know, if, 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 if the level of trust is not very high, don't exacerbate it. Um, don't insult the other side. Don't create stress that's not necessary. I mean, you should be trying to trying to restore trust as much as possible. So if the trust is not there in the first place, just look at ways in which you can uh, be willing to 
uh, if, if you know there's something which you can fairly easily give away, um, you should never give away things easily. You should you should not say at the beginning of a negotiation, well, I'm going to give you all these things because then it'll create a good atmosphere. All, everything you give should be contingent on getting something from the other side. But um, reciprocity also applies, applies to information and sharing information. And so I think if, if you make it very clear to the other side that you are you're the sort of person who actually is honest. What you see is what you get. You know, when I say I'm a, a man or woman of my word, etc. So make it very clear that even though the other side may be behaving in a way you don't like very much, that, um, uh, that, 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 that you are trustworthy because trust is reciprocal as well. So you can try to sort of build trust is, is, is what you're trying to do. And I think the other thing is to try not to you know, there's a tendency for people to blame other people uh, when things go wrong, to blame the other side and say, well, it's their fault. It was within their control and they ignored it. And that's why we've got a problem. But also that's known as the, 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 as the um, accuser bias. But often on our own side, we subject to the excuser bias that um, we will make excuses for ourselves. And it's, it's, it's never our fault. It's always somebody else's fault. So be prepared to accept that you may not be right all the time and that the people on the other side of the table, if they come to a different conclusion, you it doesn't mean they're bad. Um, so try to sort of reduce those, those tensions from trust. Um, and I, and I've got another question, which I think may be partly answered. Is there a point at which you can divulge too much information that will end up being detrimental to a negotiation? And when is it too early to show your cards? Yeah, well, this is a very good question. Um, I, I think certainly um, you, you do need to be careful about what you're, what, what you're divulging. As I said, uh, information is reciprocal. So I think generally keeping your cards fairly close to your chest while at the same time coming across as being comparatively open is important. But I would always say don't don't give away more than you have to, uh, both in terms of information, but in terms of the substantive issues, and uh, because you should be trading all the time. And when is it too early to show your cards? Well, <laughs> at the beginning, um, but um, uh, no, you should you should not. Uh, you know, you can share information which you know is harmless, particularly information that's already in the public arena, even though the other side may not realize it's it's publicly available. Um, uh, it's not dishonest to say, well, I'm prepared to tell you this. And if they turn around and say, we already know it, well, that's, well, that's okay. So a question here on... Um, how can you understand the value of your own product or service and that of others? Uh, and then, for example, an entrepreneur with a startup uh, selling uh, selling funding or, or acquiring funding, I think, is, is, is or seeking funding, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think that um, th th one of the things we grapple with in life generally is overconfidence. Um, one reason that a lot of startups fail is because um, of uh, confirmatory bias. The bias that and we talk, we teach a lot about biases and about psychological biases in negotiation and decision making. And human beings do tend to be overconfident. It dates back to when we were hunters and gatherers. We never knew whether we we're going to have enough food at the end of the day if we didn't gather enough berries or or collect up enough meat. Um, and so uh, people, human beings are overconfident. And so I think it's very, very important to step back and be prepared to listen to people who are telling you something which you don't really want to hear. Because we tend to pay attention to the things we want to hear. And in the case of startups, for example, um, they will often... Uh, people often give them information which suggests that whatever it is may not work that well. Do listen to that. And in negotiation, do listen to people who, on your own side, 
who present an alternative view. More questions? Um, any tips about overcoming hostility, moving things forward when things um, uh, have come to stand or become stuck? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes doing something unexpected can help break the logjam. Um, a classic case which we touch on a little bit in, uh, in the program is uh, in 1977-78, um, Israel and Egypt um, had, had experienced several wars, uh, there was a lot of distrust there, um, and uh, the White House, Jimmy Car President Jimmy Carter, um, was trying to get both sides uh, to, to come to talks. Um, there had been several efforts in Geneva and so on, and then what caused the breakthrough there was that President Sadat of Egypt said, if I am invited, I am willing to travel to Israel and address the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. Um, I think observers at the time thought the invitation wouldn't be forthcoming, but Menachem Begin, the Israeli premier, um, uh, issued the invitation, Sadat then accepted it, traveled to Israel, and that put everything on a totally different footing. So sometimes, and, and ultimately that led to the Camp David Accords. Uh, so sometimes doing something the other side doesn't really expect um, can actually be the breakthrough. The other thing is actually simply having a break. Sometimes it all becomes a bit too intense. And so actually saying, look, we're not making progress at the moment. Um, yes, we do have a... a, a, a you know, we, we do have some pressure to get this completed, but why don't we just take a couple of days, depending on how long the negotiation is, it could be a couple of hours, but in a longer negotiation, maybe a couple of days, why don't we take a couple of days off, we can regroup, we can come back to the table um, a little bit refreshed, uh, having taken opinions from other people we, we work alongside, and um, then we can maybe approach it uh, afresh So I have another question. How would you handle a difficult counterpart? Um, one who is underprepared, one who's untrustworthy, and is not interested in win-win. Actually, it's interesting. If, if the person who asked that question used the phrase win-win, uh, I should tell you that we, we try not to use that because we try to move away from the idea of winning and losing, even if this is talking about both sides winning. So I, I think The Art of War um, is, is, a, is a wonderful book, and it's got some fabulous advice, but the very title is a bit off-putting as a guide for negotiation, because I don't like to think in terms of winning, don't like to think in terms of war, but that's maybe quibbling, quibbling a little bit. But if, if, if the other side is not interested in, uh, in creating value and getting a result that is good for both of you, not interested in mutual benefit and so on, um, I think if somebody's not well prepared, um, there's no harm in saying, look, I don't think we're all quite ready for this negotiation. You can put it in a way which is not pejorative to the other side, but say, you know, maybe we're not quite there yet. We shouldn't really start yet. Um, if the other side is untrustworthy, that's obviously very difficult. You often can't say to people, you know, you're lying, stop it, and so on. Um, and I think you just need to get across, uh, you know, I have a friend who's a barrister, and I've discussed with him how he talks to witnesses um, that are lying. And he's gives, given me examples of where he, there are different ways of, of calling them and saying, uh, that's a lie, or... Um, Surely that can't be right. Uh, have I understood you correctly? And, and, and repeating the thing that they know they have lied about. 
demonstrated and untrustworthy, but doing it in a in a in a, a, a comparatively friendly way. I think the worst thing about untrustworthiness and so on, the, the, the bad behavior is reciprocal. And if one side is, is behaves badly, the other side can as well. And I think it's important that you um, uh, if you if you the, the you you sort of this is a difficult thing to describe, but you take yourself in a way out from the negotiation, even though you're sitting there at the table, and you sort of take yourself. So one of the great negotiators at Harvard coined the idea of uh, go to the gallery um, and look down on yourself and your counterpart and really audit. Uh, both of your behavior. So if you sort of remove yourself from it, so these are the sorts of things that you do. If the other side is, is unprepared, I mean, is, is really the idea of getting, of, of saying we're not quite ready for this. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was invited by the United Nations uh, to go to North Korea uh, to teach the UN officials that were based in Pyongyang um, how to negotiate. Uh, it actually turned out to be more interesting than I expected. Well, I knew it was going to be interesting anyway, but half the people that I was teaching were North Koreans and half of them were were, were from other parts of the world who had been sent there. Um, but when I arrived, there was a, a US team uh, that had come to negotiate with the North Koreans quite separately from what I was doing um, uh, on, a, on a food aid program. And I talked to the people from the World Food Programme who I was going to be teaching, and I said, well, how's that going? And they said, well, it's just unbelievable because these guys arrived and they had not prepared anything at all. Uh, they had a lot of money, which they were ultimately going to give to the North Koreans, but they didn't know which provinces um, the highest levels of starvation were in. They didn't know which provinces NGOs were allowed to visit to help distribute the food aid and so on. And they just talked until late in the night and um, and they also got straight off the plane um, uh, without getting any rest because they just wanted to get on with it. And it was just a disaster. And uh, and they were giving something away. It wasn't going to be terribly complicated negotiations, but the other side really ran rings around them. So uh, it all comes down to make sure you're prepared yourself. But if you come across people that are ill prepared, you just need to, to call a pause. Any more questions? Maybe one more. Final question. Right. Let's see what this is. Can you give an example in your experience where trust and reciprocity has added value or got better results for each party? Or if not from your own experience, examples of where this has happened? Um, yeah, I think that, that, that it's much easier to look at the bad cases. And if you look at the number of mergers and acquisitions that go wrong, um, they are often... Uh, because people have not done their homework, and they don't trust the other side. Um, I do work in China, and I, I find sometimes there's there's mistrust because there are different attitudes towards um, how how open people are willing to be, and so on. So um, uh, I think that it is a case of demonstrating to people you're negotiating with that you are somebody that they can trust. It, it all comes down, it, it all comes back to reciprocity. So um, certainly in my Chinese negotiations, I have sometimes, a couple of times, I found that there was an element of mistrust to start with uh, because uh, they, didn't, they didn't know me um, and you, you have to work at it. You have to really get back to what I said with the very first slide, um, put your second slide, put yourself in the other side's shoes. Um, I think in when I was working on Bosnia, um, there was quite a lot of mistrust uh, between the high representative to Bosnia, it was Karl Bildt, the former Swedish prime minister. Um, he was the UN's high representative, and he said uh, that um, the Bosnian Serbs should not get um, uh, the aid that was available uh, if they were not willing to comply with the conditions of the Dayton Peace Accords. And there was a standoff between the World Bank who said, well, we need to encourage everybody uh, that there's a good alternative to war by benefiting from the economic advantages of, 
uh, that we're trying to put in place there and so on. And the breakthrough on that came really of saying of, of uh, the World Bank, and I was the spokesman, so I was the person who really had to say it, uh, of saying, well, look, these are the rules we have to operate under, but we very much see it from your point of view. And uh, I was actually asked a, a question by the BBC, well, how are you going to break this logjam? And the answer was really, well, we wouldn't be there, an economic institution, if it wasn't for the political settlement uh, uh, of Dayton. And therefore, we really value what Carl Bildt and his colleagues bring to us because we don't have that experience. They do have that experience. So it was a case of getting across that we recognize that we don't agree with you entirely, but we recognize your wisdom. So I think it is, again, all about reciprocity. And that did actually lead to a breakthrough um, because we, we weren't being confrontational anymore. And I think that one of the things that worries me about the Brexit negotiations is that from all sides, there's been an awful lot of confrontation. And I think dialing down the rhetoric uh, really helps. And I think that I, I very much hope that that's what's going to happen with the uh, Brexit negotiations. So that's about all I think we have time for. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, uh, there's one additional slide which I would like to just put up there that for anybody who's interested in the officer program of negotiation. There's the information. You can go to our website and find out more about it. You can find out all about the, um, uh, the, 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 the people that are teaching it. And I'll just ask Cindy to say the last word. I just wanted to say thank you very much, Tim, for talking us through this really interesting webinar. We've had some great questions come through from the audience and we've had some really positive feedback as well. So thank you for taking the time out today. And thank you also to everybody that joined us this afternoon. It's been really great to see the questions come through and again, really interesting to hear Tim respond to those um, totally off the cuff. <laughs> so thank you. Um, just to let you know, a recording will be available soon and we'll be sharing that with all people registered. Be, uh, feel free to share that um, with any colleagues that may also be interested in, in hearing uh, what we've gone over today. Um, I'll also be very happy to answer any questions you might have about the Oxford Programme on Negotiation and my details should be on your screen there. If not, um, they are available on the Oxford Programme on Negotiation website. Thank you again and um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us and I hope I answered your questions reasonably well and um, hope I may meet some of you in due course. Thanks a lot. Thank you now.